Hey guys, welcome back to the Ace Podcast. I'm your host, Darren C. Joe. That's right, with a C in the middle. Um, here on Ace, what we do is we talk about entrepreneurial well-being and how to build a sustainable and impactful career as a solo founder in this new world of work. So one of the really cool parts about writing a book, which I did this April, is getting to meet like a lot of really cool readers. And one of them is Steve McCready, who is the guest on this week's show. Steve reached out to me after um, reading my book. We connected. I actually jumped on his podcast a few months ago, but I also wanted to get him on my show as well because Steve is a therapist. He's a coach. He's been in this line of work for nearly two decades. I knew I wanted to do a podcast with him about listening because that's been such a huge part of his work and i also think whenever i talk to him like he's so present he's so there with me and i wanted him to to share some tips about that on this show so what we originally wanted to do was talk about uh, the art of listening and the skill of listening but it turned into a conversation about topics like sticky notes patience fear and listening drawing boundaries iteration honoring yourself (laughs) with a whole lot of superhero references uh, thrown into the conversation. But the time flew by like that. Um, It was a lot of fun to record. And I just asked you to really listen to how Steve asks questions, even though this is my podcast, right? Just uh, listen to how he absorbs what I'm saying and how he asks questions. I want to share one quote uh, before we jump into the episode that really stuck out for me. And this is when... Steve and I were talking about really acknowledging the role of fear when we're listening to other people. So this is what he said, asking yourself, what is this person afraid of is powerful because fear drives so much of what we do on some level. If you are mindful of that and bring some respect to that, that can be very powerful. So that's a little nugget for you guys to chew on. Um, Next time you're listening to an employee or a colleague or a partner even, ask yourself, you know, what is this person afraid of? You can find all my past podcast episodes at upstartist.tv slash ace. I also uh, write a biweekly newsletter there that you can sign up for. So you can check out past podcasts and past writings at upstartist.tv. All right, now let's get to my conversation with Steve. All right. It is my pleasure to have Steve McCready on the ACE podcast. Steve is the host of the Sensitive Rebel podcast. He's also a therapist and a coach. But Steve, welcome to the ACE podcast. I'm really looking forward to this. Hey, Darren. It is really good to talk to you. I'm glad to connect and and happy to be on the show. So Steve, can you just tell me a little bit more about what you do? Um, well, it depends on like how you want to, how you want to look at it. So the way I like to say it is really what I do is I help people become the best possible version of themselves. That's, that's it in its most simple way. I'm not a big, uh, like terminology guy. I don't like to try and keep things simple and accessible. And that's really what I'm about is helping people to be what they're capable of, um, so that they can do what they're meant to do in the world. And how long have you been, could you just take me back a little bit, not to make this sound like a job interview, but I'm just curious because I (laughs) I truly don't know, like how long you've been a a therapist and what you were doing before then and when you pivoted to doing coaching as well. Sure. So, I mean, if we want to really go, go all the way back, we could say that I was, I was kind of doing a therapy work in high school in a sense. And I don't mean that in the literal sense I was working as a therapist, but I was, I was kind of that guy. Um, to my friends, I was the one they would call and talk to when they were going through stuff. But um, then, um, never really actually thought much of that. Went to college um, and thought when I went to college I was going to be possibly either a chemist or a writer. Neither of those happened. Came out of college not having the faintest clue what the heck I was going to do. Stumbled around for a few years. Started an, an IT career. So did um, did that for a few years, which was fun but unfulfilling. 
hit my hit kind of a very, I'll say very early, um, midlife crisis or maybe a late early life crisis or whatever you want to call it. Um, at uh, about 29 that, where I was just really unhappy, angry, frustrated, a whole bunch of things had kind of a, a crash really, um, in a lot of ways had an episode of major depression that led to me getting into therapy and through that process and some of the work there really got to a point of understanding and acceptance that my career wasn't working for me and that I needed to find something else. And so, um, did some career counseling work and some exploration there. And it was from that, that the idea of pursuing a career in therapy emerged. Um, now through all of this, I, I spent a good year basically telling anyone who would listen, well, I'm stuck. I, I don't know how to do anything else. I'm too old to go back to school and all of this stuff. And now let's remember I was like 29, 30. I, I started grad school at like, I was 31 when I started grad school and I walk in on the first day and half the people in there are older than me, of course. Right. It's like, Oh, I guess I'm not. Um, so that was the end of the, I'm too old story for me. But, um, so I started working as a therapist actually fairly early in grad school. I had a opportunity to get a part-time job in a local agency. And that was in, that was going back to like 2002. So like March, 2002 was when I began that stayed at that agency until I finished grad school, got licensed, opened my practice in August of 2006. And so have been doing that since then over the last several years, I've been making kind of a gradual pivot more towards coaching, which is where my focus is now. And increasingly, and that's my goal is to ultimately really do just that, um, you know, and so that's, that's the area where I'm more actively seeking to grow my work at this point. Um, though, so it's really, I do a mix of both right now. Wow. And, and so for solo founders, you know, that, you know, I, I wrote the book, the Safe solopreneur, I was on your show and we explored that. Do you work with a lot of solo founders in your current business and it, as a therapist as well? They it's so it's, it's like like so many things, everything kind of ebbs and flows in my world. But definitely I have seen and worked with and work with a number of folks who are either solo biz people, sometimes, you know, people who have a very, a very small biz. So number of things, but definitely more on the small side. I'm not working like with, you know, large, large scale corporate executive types. Um, it is more of the solo and small biz people who who I you know do my coaching with work with primarily. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And and so for someone like myself, if I was looking for a business coach or if I was looking for a therapist, I mean, what would you advise someone like myself to, to look for in each of those? Because I think sometimes, like you said, they can kind of mix perhaps. Yeah, there's it's kind of a Venn diagram thing, right? It's absolutely a Venn diagram thing. On the therapy side, where it's exclusively that, if we're looking at things diagnosable, mental health disorders, right, depression, anxiety, you know, substance use, addiction issues, those sorts of things really need to be dealt with by somebody who is trained and licensed as a therapist. But then there's areas that are more into the realm of things like, you know, performance, focus, things like that, that really could be kind of either. Um, and then you know, as we go more into the realm of possibility, optimization, improvement, that kind of falls more into the realm of coaching. So there's a couple other ways that it sometimes gets articulated. Um, one, one person I know, the way they put it is they go, coaching, or sorry, therapy is going from negative five to zero, and coaching is going from zero to five, right? I like to say it is therapy is getting from bad to good, coaching is getting from good to great. Love that. That makes it, you know, crystal clear. And yeah, I'm wondering if you've ever, if you've seen sort of common issues or problems from solo founders that we could just talk about for a little bit before diving into our main subject. But I'm just, you know, genuinely curious sure. because I'm sure that could help so much of our audience. Well, there's, there's, and there's a couple that immediately jump to mind for me that I see in there, there are related. One is focus. Um, and another one is overthinking, uh, mm. and, the, and the two again can kind of, can kind of feed each other. 
Now, a lot of the folks that I work with are people who are um, more towards the feeling and sensitive end of the spectrum. And so they especially are prone to this, but I, I've seen it with others as well, right? They're seeking to optimize, they're seeking to be successful. We live in a world that is just full of noise and ideas and suggestions and schemes and do this and do that, and do right? And so it's it's hard to filter through it anyway. And then if you have any sort of self-doubt, any sorts of wondering, you know, you start to see how other people are doing it. And so what can happen is a couple of things. One, you can just end up going, you know, pivoting this way and that way and this way and that way and, and not really staying on track. Or what I see sometimes with people is they they get into almost this sort of freeze response where they're like, they don't do anything. So they're like, I don't, I don't know. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? And they don't do anything. And with those folks, I often will do the work of helping them get out of their head because they're just trying to sort all this stuff out in their head. And I'm like, you got to, I'll tell them like, get a pen and a big stack of sticky notes and we're going to start writing stuff down and we're going to get this out of your head and we're going to get it organized so we can figure out a plan. So those are the two that most immediately stick out to me. Um, time management is another one, of course, and energy management. But to me, those all also relate to, again, focus and prioritization. So those are, those are probably the primary ones that I see. I mean, is that kind of the best place to start is getting out those sticky notes or that journal or that notepad when it comes to, to overthinking? I'm, I'm particularly interested in the overthinking issue. It's hard to tell whether you're overthinking if you're not talking to someone about your thoughts or externalizing them, right? Right, <laughs> right. Well, and it's, it, it's often a byproduct of, or, or overwhelm is the thing people will say too, which are, which are similar, right? They're, and maybe not, some, this is a semantic thing, I think at a point, but I think that getting it out of your head in some form is where it needs to start because there's a way in which once it's external to us, we can start to see it differently and think about it. The reason why I like sticky notes is because you can take individual thoughts and ideas and you can articulate each one on a separate piece of paper. And because they're sticky notes, you can then proceed to move them around. And it allows you to take the thoughts and organize them. Now, mind you, a good mind mapping program can do the same thing on a computer, right? And so it's, um, but I like the act of writing it down, the act of having it visual. So this is where I'll like get a, a, a wall in a room or some people will use like a mirror or a window. It does any open space. And then you can just start to sort the thoughts out and you start to find patterns or categories, but it lets you get things out there and start to think about like either whether it's a, okay, what's my goal or what is my strategy going to be here? What, you know, tactics, and you can start to sort it out and think through it. And it really just facilitates exploration at a deeper level, I think. No, absolutely. And so how long would a session last for typically? With, so with my, with my coaching clients, generally I do my sessions right around an hour. Um, I try not to be super rigid about time because, you know, sometimes we're in the middle of a, of a thought and it's like, why don't I want to at least try and get to a good closure point. But also for me, when I'm working with my clients, the way that I work with them, which is maybe different than some coaches is it's not, it's not just a, okay, we have this session once a week and, uh, between then you're on your own, right? It's like, no, I tell them, I'm like, if you know, if you're working on something, something comes up, you have a quick question, shoot me a text or an email. And so it's because really I'm there as a resource to them. The calls are just a piece of it, right? It's like I contract with them by the month and I'm here to support and help you and um, to try and do that. Because sometimes, you know, there's a thing that they're wrestling with or something comes up or an idea or, or a question. And sometimes just a little quick back and forth can help keep them moving. And I really want to try and maintain that momentum for them. How much diversity do you see amongst your your entrepreneur clients? I'm just curious, like, does it all start to sound kind of similar to you? Or is it really, wow, like the spectrum of focus or overthinking or energy management is like so extreme with this one guy and, you know, so minor with this one lady or whatever it is. I'm just curious, like, I mean, to to be there listening to an entrepreneur's biggest problems and issues and like trying to sort those things out. Like I, I'm just, yeah. What is that like? <laughs> well, it's, 
I, I think sometimes people wonder, like, D don't you get bored? And it, it's kind of like this. And, and this is what's on my mind because because we were talking about Shang Chi at the beginning here <laughs> yes. before. before <laughs> Shang Chi, right? that's right. So so, but it's it's like, come on, when it comes to superhero movies, there's some just very basic conceptual plot lines. I mean, you could argue this with stories in general, right? We know like we're all familiar with the hero's journey and that concept. And so absolutely, I see a lot of very similar themes because these are human challenges and human struggles, but each one has its own unique aspects. The proportions are maybe a little bit different or it's got this, you know, this sort of perspective or angle on it. So I don't find myself ever, ever bored it's even, it's actually, it's kind of nice because there's the familiarity of the process and the same concepts, but then there's the uniqueness of how are we going to apply or use it here? Um, and so to me, it's the, just the right mix of familiar and different that I think it keeps me very interested and engaged personally. What is your favorite resource to recommend to, to, to clients? Do you have like a, a favorite book or like a stack of books i so yeah it, it really depends on the situation and the person okay because it can be it can be any number of things i i don't tend to as a rule have any given thing as far as like you know everyone needs to read this or everyone should do this thing beyond a couple of very basics i mean the, the thing i always want to understand to them is mm -hmm. i want to understand the the idea and the question i'll often ask is how will we know when we're done like, and, and the idea is to get them to imagine out into a future where they are, where they want to be, where they you know, have, have achieved what they need to achieve and they don't need me anymore. And there, there's a couple of reasons I do that. One, it's about getting that target that helps us to focus our work. And number two, it's really laying the idea out on the, on the front end that like my goal for all of my clients is to have them not need me. They might still choose to, you know, have me work with them, but I, I don't want to foster dependency. I want to help these people, you know, do what they want to do. And so I'm trying to get them to imagine that idea of getting to that place, you know, so that's, that's one thing that's pretty consistent, but like with books or things like that, it really depends. There are certainly ones that show up, you know, at different times. Um, but I also am increasingly reluctant to lean too much on tools because I find because it gets in the way potentially of people doing the thing they often need to do, which is spending more time looking inward or listening inward as the case you know, might be. And it's really easy to get caught up in all this outside input. And especially for some of the folks that I work with, it, it that can be its own problem. It just becomes a whole bunch more noise, you know, a whole bunch more things to do or to try or whatever. Right. And so for me, those resources are more when I think when we come up with like, okay, I want to go this route or I want to do this kind of a thing, then it's a, oh, here's a book that will, you know, give you some useful information or give you some ideas about how, how to do it. And so I really try and do it where it's very, a very specific solution to a very specific situation. Hmm. I mean, and on that note of not overwhelming your, your clients with, you know, more information, more books, more resources, and giving them the space to look inwards, as you say, I'm just curious, like, how do you advise people to do that? Is it just because, yeah, I, I'm throwing, I don't want to answer my own question, but I'm genuinely curious about that because I think listening to our own voice so to speak, is, I mean, it's so hard to do, but it's been so essential for me, at least in, in my entrepreneurial experience. Often it's about asking questions and getting out of the way. Getting it, out of it, your own way. Getting out of their way. Me, for me, it's about me asking them a question and then stepping back and staying out of the way, right? It's, it's really easy and always tempting to be, to be there you know, with advice and with ideas about, well, you should do this or all of that. But a lot of the time it is, asking a question that's designed, I may have an idea of, okay, here's an area where you might want to look. And so I'll ask a question, you know, designed to get them poking around in there and exploring. And then maybe that, you know, nudges, or I might sometimes share observations, right? You know, I'm noticing this, or I have the sense of this and share my impressions. But a lot of that's designed to kind of help 
open up that space for exploration to get people looking inward and to generate some things. Now, what we do with that, you know, it could be any number of things. It depends on on what comes out, right? It might be like, oh, this is something we should apply or something we should um, incorporate into the strategy you're developing. Or it may be this is a thing you should do some journaling on, or maybe it's just some, you know, something else. Who knows what, what we'll do with it. But it's to you know to bring out kind of some some raw material, so it can be uncomfortable to people. But when they start to engage it and start to do it, it can be really powerful. And you never quite know. Sometimes really unexpected stuff turns up, mm. which is cool. Over the past six months or so, two books have really, well, one book in particular has really stood out to me. It's called Leading with Questions. You know, the author really espouses exactly what you said, which is letting people kind of come to their own conclusions in, in a sense, right? Because as you said, every person is so individual, so unique. You can't prescribe one book, one practice for everyone, right? But a big part of that is listening, and this idea of listening has really been on my mind. In fact, when I started the show, I originally wanted to do a podcast just about listening. <laughs> or if not listening, to have, you know, for example, season one would be about listening, listening to yourself, listening to others, listening to your customers, listening to maybe spiritually listening, if, if that's important to you. And so I really want to dive deep into this topic because I think well, gosh, what, two decades now you've been doing this and and have probably really honed your skill here as well as come to some thoughts about the practice of listening and its importance. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll sort of frame uh, this conversation with, let's, let's think about listening in terms of a, a business context. So listening to customers, listening to employees, listening to partners. Let's start there before we do the hard stuff of listening to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think all of those things might be hard for some people, but I think you're right. The listening to yourself and creating the space and the quiet yeah. to listen to yourself is probably for many the hardest part of all of our hardest of all of those things. Yes. I mean, I, at least I found that for me personally, but I really believe that listening and a sort of empathy towards others after 10 years of running my own business, I believe it is the core skill to succeed. Now, many people would argue with me about that, but I truly believe like getting out of your own way when you're putting a product or service in front of someone and listening to see how they respond to it, you know, is so important. And so few of us actually do it, <laughs> but yeah, maybe we can start with just general, any sort of First, at a higher level, general advice you might have on how we can really listen to the person sitting across from us. Have a piece of paper or a notebook and, a, and something to write with handy, which might seem like slightly weird advice, but I'm going to explain why. Actually, and I'll illustrate it with a story. When I started, my when I first started working as a therapist, so this is when I was still in graduate school. And, you know, as part of the, the training and licensing process, you have to be supervised by a licensed therapist. And what that generally means is either sometimes you might record sessions and they might listen to those or you talk to them just about what you're working on and what's going on. And I one of the things that I that came out with my work early is that I was having a hard time because um, I was interrupting my clients. And we were talking about that. And I was like, well, yeah, because I. I I have these questions that I want to ask them and I don't want to forget the questions. Right. And these, it makes me think of these things. And so my supervisor was like, well, um, why don't you just bring a notebook in and make some notes? And, and I was, you know, young kind of clueless at the time. I'm like, is that okay? Right. Right. <laughs> it's like, is that okay? <laughs> Which in retrospect is like a ridiculous question because the, the, that actually focuses too much on the tactical thing. It doesn't focus on, like, why are you doing that? The reason, and this is what she pointed out. She's like, why are you doing it? I'm like, so I can capture these ideas and not interrupt, which will, you know, which is like, which will allow you to be more engaged with them. Right. And like, oh yeah. So, you know, so that's why I say that because it allows us because inevitably, 
right? People are going to be saying things and you're having thoughts and reactions. And it's like, like you, you're, you're writing little notes as I I'm am. talking here, which is perfect. Exactly. There you go. So you're, cause you, yeah, see, you're making these notes, which is, which is good. Cause that way you can kind of come back to those things and they're there and that allows you to stay engaged in the conversation. And that's why I think that that's so important because that gives us the space to do that, to honor what's coming up for us while still honoring the person that we're listening to. So I think that that's one. I think that being patient is another, which is hard, right? We have to wait and wait and wait. And sometimes we think like, is this person ever going to finish? Um, but they will, they won't talk forever. Most likely their strategies to deal with that. If, if they really, if they really do, but we, and we wait, you know, that's, that's, I think the, the starting point. So often we're like wanting to get on to the next thing. Let's get through this. Let's get in. Let's move on. Like, what do you want? What do you need? And it's, that's just not how it works. Some of us need to sort through things verbally. We need to talk ourselves around in circles a little bit until we get where we're going. And so if you want to hear what that person has to share, you're going to have to be patient with them. Yeah. I mean, one practice I have, I'm always trying to be a better listener if I can. And one is to just really give that person more time to finish. So for example, you just finish answering that question. I'll usually wait a few seconds, you know, before jumping in there. Cause I, I, I know I hate it when I'm talking and someone kind of just jumps in and diverts or perhaps is, you know, starts looking at their phone or just isn't looking at me or, you know, doesn't absorb what I'm saying. So that's the way I think about it. And I'm not even know, not even sure if that's healthy or right, but, you know, I just try to be literally there to absorb, not just what they're saying, but the intention behind what they're saying as well. Right. Cause oftentimes, as we know from movies and, and, and books in the scenes, the characters never directly say what they want. <laughs> True. <laughs> right? it, it, it's rare. Right. Yeah. So well, there's almost always multiple channels of communication going on. Um, and it allows us to pick up on those. If we're, if we're staying engaged and we're thinking about not just what are the words. And a lot of the time what we're doing is thinking about like, how do I make a counter argument to this person's point yes. or how do I respond to what yeah. this person is saying? Instead of just letting it all come out, trying to absorb it as comprehensively as we can, not just the words, but the tone, our knowledge about the person and what might be underlying feelings or fears. And I always think asking yourself, what is this person afraid of is powerful because fear drives so much of what we do on some level. And so if you are thinking about that and trying to be mindful of that and to bring some respect to that, that could be really powerful. Wow, I love that. What is this person afraid of? I mean, it sounds kind of sad, though, in a way, right? That fear would drive so much of what we do. But it seems like that's been, that's, you know, really key insight for you. Well, what, what I've seen is the, this is, so it used to be thought that it was kind of this combination, right? There was we were driven by this mix of fear and love, right? So we would go towards what we loved and away from what we were afraid of. The more recent research on this topic seems to be pointing towards, no, it's some love, it's all fear, um, which is, which is on the one hand, it is really sad. But let me, let me say this too, Darren, is despite that, we seem to do and create and build some amazing things. So I think fear is like any feeling. It can be very problematic. Even joy can be problematic, right? As anyone who's seen Inside Out can tell you. But um, but it, it's but fear can also be really powerful. It can lead us to do things we otherwise would not do in the name of protecting someone we care about or love. It can lead to, you know just all kinds of creative stretching and pushing of ourselves if we use it right. Okay, 
you've you've got me totally fascinated. So let's let's take my my last biggest project, which is writing a book, right? On the surface, I would think, okay, this is a life goal, a life dream to write a book. I've always just wanted to write write a book. It seems like a like a positive feeling that is pushing me towards that. But you're kind of saying that fear could drive a lot of these, you know, someone's say great achievements in their career. I'm not saying my book is a great achievement, but yeah. So like, how would you sort of dissect that? Well, great, great question. So, so I'm going to say a couple of things. I, I think your book's a pretty good achievement. As you know, I'm, I'm a fan of, of your book. I mean, it, it's, it's that and the awareness of that. That's what led to me reaching out to you in the first place and us connecting. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's actually a pretty awesome achievement, but if I can ask you a question, and so this may get a little personal, so feel free to, to go here as much as you do or don't want. But really, in a more general sense, what are you afraid of? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going deep here. We're going deep here. I mean, honestly, the first word that came to my mind when you asked that, and I'll, I'll just say it, was irrelevance. I mean, when you asked me, what's the first, what, what are you afraid of? I just said, I, the first word that popped in my mind was irrelevance. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe that is kind of the driving thing at the root of the task, the onerous well, task. <laughs> well, let's, let's look at that. It is the act of creating a book, right? You've got this content, this written material, structured, organized in a literal, physical form. That is your thoughts, your ideas, your work that is there. So one, it's got also, there's, there's also a more of a, um, a, a more permanence about it. Cause that's another thing people are often afraid of, right. Is, is kind of being forgotten. That's right. Um, Absolutely. Or, or being irrelevant. And it clearly has supported you being able to make some connections, to get some attention, to get some awareness, right? Without your book, we probably would not have met <laughs> as, an, as an example. Yeah. And um, and yeah. I know my, my life would be less for that because I think you're a really great guy and I've enjoyed the conversations that we've had. And so, yeah, see, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great point. And it's not to say the other things don't have an influence. And and again, I'm I'm not here to say that it's definitively one or the other. I'm just kind of commenting on what I'm aware of from the, the research. Um, but I, but when we start to look at this and we go, yeah, I don't want to be irrelevant. Of course you don't because you're a human and we all want to matter. We all want to do things that are meaningful. It's how we're wired and it's, you know, and so of course we don't want that. And so it's like, yeah, how do we do, how do we address that? Well, it can be done really powerfully when it's something like writing a book. And and you just kind of ride that wave beneath the surface, right? Like, uh, how do you advise your clients to kind of harness those that fear productively? Well, I, right. I, I think that is what it is. It's it, it's learning to blend with it, right? I'm um, I don't remember if we've talked about this before, and this is something in my past now, but um, but I did Aikido for a few years, uh, which I absolutely loved. I first read about it, and it was like, this is so cool. Like, I just love the idea from a physical standpoint, right, of blending with this energy and then redirecting it. I'm like, that's so cool. But that's what we're talking about. We're just talking about, in this case, in the sense of more feeling energies, right, is how do I take that fear and align with it and let it in and go, you know, why am I afraid of that? What's what's going on there? You know, learn more about it and then ask, okay, what would speak to that fear? What would combat that fear? How do I redirect that fear and use it? And it's a thing of, you can use that as that push when you're trying to get the book done or whatever. And you're like, oh, God, this is so, so hard. And I so just want to like abandon this thing or whatever. Right. And you're like, no, I need, you know, you use that energy to keep pushing you. And so I think that's where it can be really powerful. And that's, that's true with really any kind of a feeling, but um, certainly fear in this case. Because remember, it's it's kind of like, I mean, I'm getting more movie superhero, well, not superhero, but more movie fiction references. But we can think of like the force, right? I mean, the force that's is not inherently like good or bad. Exactly. Okay, yeah. well, there yeah. you go. And I think that's true of feelings too. Feelings are 
energetic messages in a sense. We can look at them that way. And we can take them and use them if we are willing to take the time to learn them and to understand them. The same way that Luke, once he takes the time to learn and understand the force, can use it, right? There's a reason that idea is there. Because the the themes and the ideas are very real and applicable in all kinds of other areas. And it's to accept it too. Because, you know, if we're stuck in this sort of, okay, I can only experience these positive feelings and all the negative ones are just trash or make me a bad person or whatever. Without bad, good no longer exists. Because good exists in relation to bad. For one and two, yeah, this idea that we there should be some magic way for us to be happy all the time. It's ridiculous. It's unrealistic. The research increasingly shows that trying to the, one of the best ways to make yourself not happy is to try and pursue happiness. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, right? Is trying yeah. trying to you know, and it is when we have allow ourselves to understand our feelings, to explore them, to sit with them and to get curious about them. We understand them better. And that gives us the ability, I'm going to say not so much to control them as it is to work with them and to make constructive use of them. And that's where a lot of power lies a lot. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I mean, do you ever get tired listening, Steve? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, mean, I'm a I do too. I, I do so too. Much energy, right? So, I mean, I, of course, I, I feel like you know, if I'm having a really deep conversation with a friend or a really important conversation with a business partner, employee, I'm exhausted after you know an hour, even like if I'm really paying complete attention, right? How can I deal with that? <laughs> um, well, self care is always always a good a good <laughs> recipe. Um, I, the question that comes up for me actually though, Darren is, is, do you have a sense of why you're tired? Like what, what is, tell me more about the tiredness. I'm, I'm curious about that. Are you flipping this podcast against me? I like I did with yours? Be. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. So when I'm tired, I just, I feel full is the way I can best describe it. I feel like my cup is full and I can't hold any more poison or any more tension or any more emotion. And I just need a break. Did I answer your question? Why do I feel full? Yeah, you yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely you did. That's interesting. Are the ways you're seeing those things or internalizing those things, is that what those things actually are? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It just feels, I feel overwhelmed though. So, mm -hmm. but maybe I can look, you know, deeper into those, that feeling of why, uh, I just know I need to turn off the spigot. Like, and I'm, I'm not, I don't like shut the door <laughs> I'm listening to, right? I'm going to like wait and be patient, but there is a time where my energy flags and at some point I like, I have to tap out. And I noticed that my friends say I'm a good listener, but I do notice that I have a shorter, um, like I'm more a sprinter when it comes to listening, not a marathon runner. Like I can only handle a certain amount. Anyways. And, and <laughs> I think, so I think there's a, the combination of things, of things here. One, I will say is look at the way that you look at these things and the way that you're defining them, because I think that's affecting the weight they have for you. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second, but also this. Of course you have limits and it's not that you can make this stuff weightless because sometimes it is pretty dang heavy. And I think that knowing your energy patterns and finding a way to honor them is crucial. I mean, this is true for anybody, right? You, we, we could be talking about you as it relates to listening. We could be talking about a, you know, um, a business person and how they run their business. I'm thinking about me and how I run my client appointments as far as how I schedule is knowing your energy flow and ups and downs and making sure that you honor that and go, okay, you know, got to tap out here, go tap out and go recharge. It's like, you know, think of it like a battery. It's like your phone, your phone gets slow. You got to plug it in and, and charge the darn thing. Or my car, if you, you know, like if you've got an EV, they got to do that. And that's totally, totally, totally appropriate. Now, 
here's the thing. One of the questions I used to get early on, like when I first became a therapist and all my friends were asking me, the question I got all the time is, don't you get tired of listening to people's problems all day long? <laughs> right. And so whatever, it was like, the, it was like total FAQ th question, right? <laughs> yeah. And the answer was like, well, no, but here's why. I'm not thinking about it as, oh my God, I've got to listen to all this drama all day long or all these problems all day long or all this complaining all day long or all of that. It's, I have the privilege of being allowed in to the inner circle of these people's worlds and being trusted in helping them sort through this and figure out a way to be able to move forward, to be able to be happier, to be more successful, to be better in their relationship, to be more impactful in the world. I have the opportunity to be a part of that journey or to be a witness to that journey, to be a supporting role in that journey. Dang, that's cool. Right. And that, that's, that's where my focus is. And that, that's one, I also have a really, really clear, which has been honed over a number of years, sense of boundaries. I know what's mine. I know it's not. So sometimes people will come and bring very heavy things. And I've learned how to go. That's not mine. My job is to share perspective to if I have you know, possibly advice or guidance or to ask good questions to help them explore it. But I can't fix it. They can, right? I can only give them tools or support to help. I don't have to solve it. They do. So it is weighty to them. And certainly the presence of that weight can be affecting to me. But knowing it's not my problem, not taking it on as my problem makes it a little bit lighter or some cases actually a fair amount lighter. So it's really a combination I, I find of the two that allows me to do that. But at the same time, here's the reality. It's like, yeah, I can only see so many you know clients in a day. I can only do so many clients in a row before I need a break because I need a chance to stop, step out of it, recharge, and then go back in. Oh, could you elaborate a little bit more on this idea of boundaries? Because I think it's, um, I mean... <laughs> There's, uh, I'm learning so much from this conversation business-wise, even though it sounds like we're just talking about a fundamental sort of communication mm -hmm. principle, right? But this idea of like, I can't fix your problems. Like, I mean, is this one example of boundaries? Do you have other examples there of how you kind of set the boundaries there? Because in, in a way, this could also apply to people you're managing or even customers, for example. Oh, it absolutely can and does. And, and let's not forget, at the end of the day, business is about people and it's about relationships. It's just on a different playing field. And so all of this stuff very, very much applies. Very, very much so. And boundaries are a huge deal. Um, I, I like to just make it super simple. I like to steal... Brene Brown's characterization of it. And she's like, boundaries are simply what's okay and what's not okay. And that's, that's really with setting boundaries with others, but it's also, you can look at it in the sense of responsibility. And for me, a lot of this is what, what I'm talking about here is, is responsibility boundaries. If I didn't create it, if I didn't cause it, if I haven't made a contract to take care of it, and if I don't have control over it, I can't fix it, right? That's just simple, simple physics. So this is the, the corollary to, I'm going to keep bringing in superhero references as much as I can, because why not? So Spider-Man, right? We all know with great power comes great responsibility. So we can thank, uh, I think it was Uncle Ben who said that one originally, right? Anyway, so now here's the corollary. If you have more responsibility than you have power, that's a problem. And so that's part of this. And part of how I manage this is recognizing where the limits of my power or authority are. And I can't control another person and their choices. Hmm. Not that I haven't tried in the past. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> I gave that one yeah. up a long time ago, but, um, you know, but that, that's a, that's a whole other <laughs> podcast and a whole other conversation. But, um, yeah. I, yeah, I can't control that. None of us can. Hmm. And so that's where it's, so it's, I also can't allow myself to be responsible for it. Right. So, um, so that, that's a piece of it. It's really about knowing where does the responsibility lie? Where does the permission lie? Where does the ability lie and setting things up accordingly? And I think, yes, 
one of the areas like founders can really struggle with is they often really are challenged. They're used to doing everything. They're used to, they're often people with a very high sense of responsibility and up to a point, that's a really good thing. But it also, if not contained, becomes overwhelming. It's a recipe for burnout and it's a recipe for all kinds of problems as you well know and as you well articulated in your book. Um, and so learning to really get that clear about where you go and where you don't go, where the lines are, is crucial for preserving not just your energy, but probably your sanity. Yeah. Yeah. And and also just getting more done. I mean, right? Like <laughs> saying, look, uh, this is your thing now. And, you know, th this is what we want. Go. Right. Um, I think... We've, we've already talked about this, so we won't go there. But yeah, I definitely fall into that, that trap many times of being the star, not, not the producer. Like, I have to do everything, you know, and I do it best. But that, that can be so limiting. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a practice I, I need to get better at. Another form of boundaries that you can use or another way to, to you can kind of conceptualize it is the idea of constraints, right? And using constraints. They're a form of boundary. And you can do that in any number of ways. It can be, I'm going to give myself this much time to do this thing. And wherever I am, I'm going to stop at that point, right? And especially if you're familiar with the 80-20 rule, like the reality is you, you could spend as much time as you allow yourself, but the reality is you could also spend a much less time and actually get it done. And creating that constraint, you know, will actually do that. Like I remember that this morning, I was working on this before I, I had my first client. I'm like, I want you to get stuff done for my next podcast episode release. And I had like th this list of 10 little tasks and I'm like, I'm going to see if I can knock all these out. And if I didn't have any constraint, if it was like a Friday afternoon, I could easily spend four hours doing them. But when I had an hour, sure enough, I crammed like almost all of them in and they're all done fine. And it's all fine. Cause I was just really focused and dialed in and aware I've got that limit. I need to honor it. And so you can use it with that, but you can also use it if you're the kind of person who takes on too much as a way of protecting not just yourself, but respecting your team. So you're not stepping on toes, you know, and not, not going where you're not really of the most service and of the most value. And that's, I think, I think it's so hard for founders is to make that shift from where they're like the one who does do everything to starting to let go of pieces and hand pieces off. Because it's it, it's a real paradigm shift, and I think some folks can't necessarily do that, right? Some of those are the ones who need to really build something up to a certain point and then exit, whereas others can learn to make the shift and, and the pivot. And I think that's an essential thing: is learning where you're at your best and and really starting to build those limitations um, and set up systems that makes it easy to just go, oh wait, nope, handing that piece over. Yeah, no, I love it. yeah. I I think this is uh, going to be one of my key takeaways from this conversation, this idea of boundaries. Let's talk about that harder topic of listening to ourselves. So when you uh, are coaching, I'm sure, many founders who need a sense of direction or need a sense of clarity because they're just overwhelmed, right? What do you think the best process... I know it will depend, right? <laughs> so, but, <laughs> I'm really answering my own questions. But as soon as he knows, as soon as he says best, he's like, "Oh man, that's not going to get a straight answer." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Darn. But you know, I, I guess what I'm just trying to get at is, you know, how can we as founders listen to ourselves, get a better sense of clarity, or is it maybe even not listening to ourselves? Maybe it's talking to others. I don't know. But I, I just know that that is um, one of the toughest challenges for me is like, especially when setting direction, because you don't have a, a co-founder, right? Uh, maybe you have a board or something, but yeah, just any ideas or thoughts that you have here in this area? A whole lot, actually. <laughs> Great. We'll see. Let's go. Um, well, we'll see what we can, what we can cover here. But I, I think... It is so valuable to know what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go. I think that that's just really essential, right? And keeping that in focus, number one. But number two, why you're trying to do that, like what you're about. I'm, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek's work, you know, start with why and all of that. 
because I think that that helps us really recognize like why we're doing it and what what we stand for, what we care about, what we're here to do, because I think that that helps us to filter out things. Because part of listening is being able to tune in, and and in our world today, noise is a huge problem. And I don't mean that literally in the sense of just like, you know, noise. I mean it in the sense of just input ideas, right? It's like we've got, you know, we've all got, you know, various social media outlets, books, podcasts, audiobooks, input, this idea, that idea. It's just a million different things. And if we are not careful, that will overwhelm us and it will drive us who knows where. Because there's no lack of people who are willing to tell you what you should do. And to tell you why you should do it. And it's not that they're inherently wrong about their ideas. It's that they may not be right for you. So I think we have to learn to filter or manage that. And I think increasingly for me, the way I'm doing this is by really trying to be more intentional about what I consume as far as anything information and what I expose myself to. Um, whereas something like, say, a social media feed is the least intentional thing there is. If you're not careful, right? It's just whatever stuff in fact, it's whatever Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whoever it is, and TikTok's the worst about this because it's, its algorithm is so creepily smart that it knows not just what you're seeing, but what you're paying the most attention to. And it's like, oh, you like this? Here, have more, right? And so like, it would be like if you, you know, so if that happened on a food standpoint, all I would have is like beer, pizza and like <laughs> donuts or something. And it would, I mean, it would be great exactly. to like die, but I would die very overweight pretty quickly. Right. Um, so we have to find ways to, to block that out. So we're more deliberate and intentional. And again, the more we know where we're trying to go, the more we can guide that. But part of what we need to do to listen is we need to create space where we have quiet. We need to also ask good questions or have good questions asked of us. And I think this is where, you know, sometimes a very big part of my work is with some people is they, they appreciate me being able to go and ask them probing questions that help them get at things that they might not find themselves. Other people might have or develop questions that they ask themselves on a periodic basis and do journaling about or thinking about, right? Um, but either way, a lot of it's about creating quiet and that could be literal quiet. I mean more quiet from an input standpoint, because for me, like quiet might mean I go for a walk while I'm listening to some, you know, some, some peaceful or kind of low key music, because that puts me in a mental frame of mind where my brain just kind of unlocks and it processes and things come out. And then I pay attention to what my brain starts spitting out, right? It starts spitting out these random ideas or thoughts or, you know, and, and it's, you know, some of them are not good and some of them are, are pretty cool. And some of them are like, whoa, that's, that's really smart, but we've got to create a space for that. And maybe I think ways of encouraging it to emerge. And this is where the questioning can come in or, or a process. Again, for some people, it may just be sitting down and journaling and kind of dumping their brain out onto the page other folks that might be having questions. I find prompts very helpful. I'm, I'm better at reacting than being proactive. And so rather than fight that nature, what I've learned to do is to create or encourage things to react to that help me go where I want to go. Right. And so I have prompts. I have questions I answer every morning when hmm. I do journaling. Hmm. Yeah. It's the, the Q squared formula, quiet, quiet times questions. <laughs> that's very cool i, I haven't know. heard that before but i like that well you you coined it uh, <laughs> no i love that <laughs> quiet and questions uh you know one difficult part with this though i mean i love this idea of being intentional with your input so you can and having your what and why in front of you when you're designing your sort of information environment <clears throat> but the one difficult part i have with that is sometimes that also blocks you from just serendipity or like in a way listening, right? If you're so focused on like one thing, sometimes you can't see what's happening to the in your peripheral vision or you're just stubbornly attached to what's in front of you. And maybe like an outsider could see, oh, wow, well, he's just pounding his head against the wall, right? So I always find it hard to strike that balance between, okay, 
I want to, I know my, you know, know your why, know your what, and like stay on that track versus wait, but maybe I'm not, you know, really listening, quote unquote, to, to what's going on and being, being fluid in that sense. I don't know if there's really a question there, but if you had any thoughts there, like. Well, I, I, you didn't explicitly ask it, but I think you're rightly identifying that as a potential uh, problem point. And the, the unasked question is, how do you prevent that? And I, I think that's a really, it's a really good point because yeah, the idea that you can just magically go turn inward, cut off the world and somehow do something that serves the world is of course not realistic. Right. And it, it's like so many of these things, it's a balancing act. And I do think there is a place by all means for putting yourself into the world and engaging. And that could be any number of forms, whether that's you actually do engage in social media and you are, you know, looking at the comments that are being left on your social media account for your product or service and you're seeing what your customers are saying or you're sending out surveys, and reading those, or you're going and talking to your employees and saying, hey, what's up? How's it going? Or setting up events. You know, I think those things are actually critical. The key is to balance that and to be mindful of what you do with it. Right. It's, it's, it's not either or it's both and, and it's the integration of them. It's the same thing. when we look at like performance, right? If we look at like, let's say we're training for any kind of physical endeavor, I don't care if it's a marathon or, you know, weightlifting, we know now that the way that you optimize that is not just harder, 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 harder. It's effort, recovery, effort, recovery. It's, you've got to do both sides of things. And I think with this, it's about focus inward turn outward, right? And engage, engage in the world. And so you can do that in a number of different forms. But I think if you're not careful, if you don't have boundaries around that, that's where it gets messy, right? So you're not yes. like, Oh, I'm going to go see what's going on on Instagram. <laughs> and then it's like 10 hours, four later. hours later, yeah. right? No, set a timer. Yeah. And that, you know, I'm going to do this for 15 minutes or an hour or whatever it is. And then when the timer goes off, stop, right? That's where I think things like structure can be super powerful is they give us these containers and we allow ourselves to do what we do in them. And so that's probably where I, I think the balancing act seems to work best for folks because, because yeah, you're right. We don't want to just isolate ourselves and um, do that because that, that doesn't work very well. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, I guess, knowing kind of where you fall on that spectrum and which way you tend to, you know, trend, P put a guardrail there, so to speak. Speaking right? of listening to yourself. <laughs> but you're, no, you're totally right. I, I think about this, like, like if someone, if we were talking about, say, you know, say a sport, let's say we talk about golf, like, let's say we've got somebody who like, they always hit the ball to the left. Well, you have two ways of fixing that one is learn how to hit the ball straighter, but the other is just aim, right? Just adjust your aim. Just like it's going to go left. So aim accordingly. Right. And, and that's, that's the thing is knowing what is your tendency because if you're someone who tends to isolate too much, yeah, you might need to create structures that support you engaging. If you're someone who's too busy out there, you need to create structures that support you turning inward. And so, yes, it's, again, this is where structure can be so powerful um, and where our frameworks are is structures help us to compensate for our own limitations or to, to basically, right, do what we need to do to support the things happening that we want and not more or not less. No, absolutely. And I, I want to come back to just, just one idea that you, uh, we were discussing in our emails back and forth. Um, and I want to talk about this because I think it's related. You mentioned, and I'm wondering where this equation comes from. Persistence plus iteration aligned with values plus identity um, can be one formula of success. For sure. Right. Let's, let's go. Please explain. Start that. Sure, sure. Um, and so here's, I, I think we live in a world that makes it seem like if you just follow this person's system and do this, you know, set up and create this funnel or this thing, you know, boom, instant success. And the thing no one talks about is the fact that that's not how it goes the great majority of the time. You know, it's, you know, it's more like this. It's like you try this thing it's a complete miserable failure or you try this thing and you don't even get halfway through before you like fall on your face and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And you walk away from it or whatever. But what can happen is from that, when we see only the stories of people doing big and great things, you know, and people driving around in their Lamborghinis, which or whatever, we do. I mean, frankly, right. that's yeah, what gets you know, featured. 
right. That's what gets featured. That's what's get shown. And it's not that those things aren't happening. It's that that's only part of the picture, right? We only see the highlight reels or when we see the bloopers, it's in this, ha ha, look at that pathetic losers, whatever. Right. And so what we don't see is the reality of there's a lot of error and stumbling on the front end and the success comes later. And so if we are willing to take a different perspective, take a longer view and go, okay, how do we build something that's great? How do we build something that is, you know, that is really high quality or how do we develop a high level of skill? Well, and we know this, it's simple. You do something, you get feedback, you use the feedback to improve the thing you're doing and you do it again. That's it, right? It's, it's, it's really that simple in, in concept. In practice, of course, that requires a lot of self-acceptance, a lot of patience, a willingness to seek and get feedback that is sometimes not going to be what you want, and then to go and do the discipline of implementing it. But that's why if we, so the persistence piece is about keep going, right? And then you try, you get some results. You use those results to refine what you do. You try again, you get some different results. You keep refining. The idea of the values piece of it is that helps you know which way to go. Because if you are taking action in a direction that aligns with your values, a couple of things are gonna happen. It's gonna feel better, it's going to be easier for you, and it's going to lead to you doing something that feels more meaningful for you and that is going to give you a greater sense of fulfillment and oh more happiness as a byproduct and more motivation to keep persisting for sure because you start getting the good <laughs> feedback and you say and it feels like there's a good reason it's like you know it's like why should i beat my head against this wall yeah well because there's something important on the other side well what something about this really what about this identity part of that you know mm -hmm. like how, how would you define the identity here so that's a, it's kind of the same. I, I would identity and values are kind of intertwined in the context of this. Um, and so I, I mean, you know, identity and in, in doing it in a way that honors who you are, right? And that honors how you operate. And so there, there's and, and that's a um, there's any number of of framings that can take, right? We've all seen the various and sundry personality tests out there as one example. Um, I just recently ran across, I don't know if you're familiar with this at all, but I just this past week and across Jonathan Field's latest work, um, he's come to develop this concept of sparkotypes, which is very interesting. Um, and again, personality oriented, but it really gets at identity in a way that I think is a little bit different, but really cool. And when you start to see that and you start to look at how does that give me specific strengths? How does that give me specific weaknesses? How does that give me specific drives? Because there's any number of ways to pursue any sort of endeavor, right? There's more than one way to do it, whether it's mastering a golf swing and playing an instrument or building a business. And when you align with you and who you are and what you stand for, it is going to be less effortful and it is going to be more satisfying. It's also, by the way, going to have this other benefit of being probably more unique which will help it to stand out versus building the same thing that everyone else has built. Right. Well, that's interesting. Does, I mean, uh, how does he define the sparkotypes? Like I, I've only, so there's, there's like 10 of them and they relate to kind of what sparks your energy and attention and interest. And so it's, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm only just got introduced to this, um, but it's very interesting. What I'll say is I did the assessment and you come up with basically three results. One is what he calls your primary one. Then there's a shadow one, which is kind of an auxiliary one. Then there's your anti one. And it was, it was totally right. Like my anti is, is the spark type he calls maker which is like kind of a, you know, someone who makes builds does things. And it's not that I don't like doing that stuff, but man, I suck at it. I don't have any patience or persistence for it. And I almost inevitably like just kind of stumble around at it as opposed to my partner where that's her primary. And I mean, she's an artist, right? And she's one of these people who's like decides I'm going to take on this project. Like last summer, she's like, I'm going to build a gardening bench. And so she goes and watches a bunch of videos. And then next thing you know, boom, there's this beautiful, like you could sell it gardening bench in our side yard. She did that with the building these, um, really cool, um, lattices to, you know, to put vines on and stuff. And she, she's just amazing what she can do with this stuff physically. And me, like if I did that, it would look like, you know, some junior high, uh, some junior high kids shop project, um, at best. 
So, um, yeah, so it's like, okay, yeah, that's totally not me, you know? Um, so, and, and so it's, it's interesting because he comes at it from different angles and it really, I think can be a good way to illustrate. And I think honor, that's the part is honoring. Like I know, like, for example, that's part of why I haven't written a book. That's a maker sort of thing, right? That's why I don't have these big comprehensive programs and these structures and these systems. I'm, I'm not against them at all. I think they're very valuable for some people, but that's hard for me to create, right? But if somebody wants someone who's going to walk with them as they're trying to sort out their journey and figure things out and who's going to be there really present with them and really engaged, seeing what there is, that's my thing. And I can do that really well. You know, so, and I have, that's part of his learning to honor that in how I operate as a coach versus some other coach out there who does it very differently. Yeah. Oh man, this is um, making me think a lot about one of the first episodes I did, uh, which was, I was interviewing a professor who specializes in ancient Eastern philosophy. And the podcast was about Wu Wei, which is effortless action. And maybe you've come across these concepts, but when you were talking about kind of you know, valuing who you are and that's what makes you unique and being in that one place where you're more effortlessly influential in a strange way. Um, and, uh, I don't know, just something I've noticed is just to watch, like in your own social situations, when do things just, when are you able to really influence people in what ways and in what situations and why? I think that's very telling. Um, that's helped yes. me. And so. this is an example of listening to yourself in a different form. It's about, you know, it, it, so it's not literally listening as much as it might be more being attentive to yourself, right? And noticing yourself. But yeah, that's, that's one of those things is learning that it's like, you know, sure. Again, same thing. Yeah. I can go get together in a group and hang out with a group and I can do that, but it's not my thing. I would much rather, and I'm way more comfortable one-on-one. -on -one. You put me one-on-one -on -one with people and I can talk and whatever, but a group is exhausting to me. Why? Because I'm an introvert. It's like, and I've learned like, okay, I could, I could fight that or I could honor it. And so I try and be mindful about it. Yeah. This has been a wonderful conversation, uh, Steve. Any, any last thing about listening that maybe you have a gripe with or you just <laughs> want to get across as someone who has listened yeah. for so, so much You're and so long? Well, here, here's the thing that I, that I want to say about this actually, yes, is, and is that the thing I see and one of the biggest mistakes that I see, and it's been a theme across the guests on my podcast, it's been a theme with a lot of my clients. It certainly was true for myself at points in my life is a lot of people don't listen to and honor themselves. And sometimes that's because they don't believe in themselves. Sometimes that's any number of other reasons. But the number of stories of someone who they tried this and they tried that and they tried this and they did all these things that were not really their own thing and then finally got on track when they finally listened to themselves and honored themselves, that's a really common theme. It's a really common theme. And I think there's a reason for that. Because again, when you're aligned with who you are, it changes things from an effort standpoint. You know, I think about this, like for me, you know, I, I, I could go on for so long about how, how challenging undergraduate was for me. Like my undergrad work was, it was so hard. Part of that was just really elevating as far as the academics, but part of it was like, I wasn't even sure why I was there, what I was going to do. It was just not, but grad school was completely different. It was aligned to something I was really interested in, something I felt really strongly about. I knew why I was doing, and I was on a very clear mission and grad school. It's a stretch to say it's effortless, but it was a lot easier. I mean, it was definitely, again, you know, much, much easier effort and all the things I had to do to get licensed and open my business and, you know, things I've had to learn. It's like, yeah, cause it was for the right reason. And it was in ways that were aligned with me. The way I built my business was different from a lot of therapists. I did it in a way that was aligned with me. And I've seen that for other people show for all the folks out there who are struggling and having a hard time. One of the things I would really encourage them to do is check in and go, are you honoring yourself or are you trying to follow the path that someone else thinks you should follow or that you're hearing about out there and that maybe what you should do instead is tune into yourself and try and listen and then figure out how you can at least build a hypothetical path with that. And if you can find a viable way there, then get support, find people who believe in and align with that. Cause like I said, there's more than one way to do any of these things. And 
the thing is when you do the one that honors you, it's going to feel better. It's going to be less effort. It's going to be, it, it's going to be more, it's just going to have more power to it. You know, it's, it's cause there's that alignment piece that really comes into play. And I think that's where for anyone, they're going to be most able to really do their thing, whatever that happens to be. Yeah. I think that's a great uh, note to end on. Um, you know, listening to and honoring yourself is it's, 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 uh, the hardest thing to do, but it might be the most powerful thing to do. I, I would agree with you on that. Yeah. Where can people, um, find more of your, your content, Steve, or if they want to work with you? Yeah. How can they best find you? Sure. So, um, online, I'm kind of all, kind of all over the place. My online presence is a bit scattered these days. I'm in the process of doing some refining to it, but where I would actually suggest, um, one of the places people could, could track me down is to go to Instagram and, um, what they could do is go find my podcast Instagram account, which is the sensitive rebel. Um, and so if you go there, that's where I post when I have new episodes, I you know post occasional other stuff there. So there's that, um, there's also in there a link to other stuff. I've got a YouTube channel, although I'm not doing much with that right now. Um, if people want to reach out to me directly, what I would say is just to, to zip me an email, Steve at Steve McCready.com. Super easy. Um, always happy to, to connect with folks and, you know, set up, set up a call to, to chat a little bit about what's going on and, um, you know, if, see if I can help them or, you know, point them at, point them at some things. Cause sometimes again, I know I didn't give you any books, but, <laughs> um, when we get into specific stuff that I'm often, I'm like, Oh, you know what, here's this book or here's that book that might, you know, that might take you somewhere. So, yeah. Fantastic. And, and yeah, please keep making more YouTube videos. I actually like your YouTube videos. Thank you. Well, I, I've just, I, so I've I just, like the walking ones where you just bring the phone and you kind of walk around your neighborhood and you're like huffing and puffing <laughs> and talking to the phone. That's, that's, the that's kind of cool. Guys. Yeah. You should. Yeah. I, 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 have, like this. I kind of got away from that and it's actually, I've just been working on trying to, to get towards where I can do that again. Cause I got a lot of real positive feedback for those. I yeah, think they're just relatable yeah. people. Um, and it's, you know, and then so, but I appreciate the the feedback on that. So I'll, I'll work on that for you. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for coming on the show. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot and uh, I'll be sure to replay this one as well. Oh, abs absolutely. I'm, I appreciate having the, the chance to come on and i um, always good to, to connect with you and get to have a conversation. It's always fun to talk to you. Um, you always, always get me thinking and, and have some interesting things to get me, you know, to think about or, or to look at. So um, it's always good to connect with you, Darren. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please press subscribe and leave us a review on your podcast app. It helps more people discover the show. Also, you can find all the show notes and links mentioned in this episode at upstartist.tv ace. That's A-S-E. Hope to see you there.